Mr. England, Ms. Hostler, Ms. Lordo, Mr. Brown, Mr. Wood, members of the council, guests and friends. On behalf of our Board of Trustees, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce you to our program this evening, the first of the 2006-2007 program. This is the 26th annual Baltimore Sun Foreign Policy Panel. Uh, we've entitled this uh, Crises in American Foreign Policy in the 2006 Elections. Uh, there's no doubt we face some crises today of a, a major kind, and uh, the elections will measure uh, part of our national response uh, to those crises, whether they be partisan or whether they be uh, serious, introspective, and, and uh, wise. Let me thank uh, the Lockheed Martin Corporation for sponsoring this evening's reception. And uh, Northrop Grumman and the Hyatt Regency Hotel for co-sponsoring the cable television rebroadcast of the program. And our anonymous member donor of wine, And uh, also for, a, for, for special support of this program, uh, monies which go back to, some of you can remember, the First National Bank of Maryland, which has gone through a, a couple of uh, incarnations since then, and is now the M&T Bank, uh, which we, we thank for this special sponsorship, which dates back a long way. <clears throat> On October the 4th, uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, we'll discuss the Port of Baltimore and its importance. And our discussant will be the esteemed Helen Bentley. Helen Bentley, of course, not only has the port named after her, but she served this community and the nation uh, in a variety of ways over a long period of time. And she's also been a member of our Board of Trustees for many years. So we as a council are indebted to Mrs. Bentley in our own particular way, just as the uh, state of Maryland uh, is indebted to her for her many services to the state. That should be an interesting evening, two weeks from tonight. Among the various programs we have is an, uh, are those that are an endeavor to keep our eyes on part of the world uh, which aren't necessarily in the headlines. The ambassador of Mongolia will join us on the 18th of October, and he has nicely referred to the United States in his title as their third neighbor, reminding all of us as to who's to the south and the north of that uh, small country. Should be an interesting evening. And a panel of very senior journalists will address the problem of the Middle East, uh, and we'll say more about that uh, uh, in our announcements on the 25th of October. As I said, our topic tonight has to do with current crises and the election. This panel is very nicely uh, prepared to deal with the foreign policy aspects of all of these major crises. Between them, they've covered all the areas of the world. And we also have on the panel uh, some deep expertise with respect to the election process and domestic politics. Uh, Mr. England, as you know, was our Moscow correspondent. He won a Pulitzer Prize in a non-foreign affairs related investigative reporting effort. He's uh, an associate editor of the editorial page today. Uh, he writes editorials on, on, on Russia, uh, on Europe, uh, the, uh, South, the Iraqi and other associated questions, Afghanistan and national security questions. Mr. Wood is the national security correspondent of The Sun now. He's had a long career in journalism. He certainly has reported from most of the areas of the world. Uh, and he's president, president as I say, uh, in Washington as the Sun's national security correspondent. Mr. Brown also, in his 16 years of journalism, has uh, reported from uh, most of the areas of, of the world. Uh, he's now serving as the congressional correspondent of the Sun. Karen Hostler is known to most of you from a variety of roles at the Sun. Among the many things that she's done in her career is to serve as White House correspondent and as chief congressional uh, correspondent. And Ann uh, Lordo 
is also on the editorial board of The Sun today. She was also at one time the head of our, uh, our The Sun's uh, Jerusalem Bureau. So the panel's nicely uh, experienced in foreign affairs and with deep experience as well in domestic affairs. It's my great pleasure to turn the panel over to its chair, Mr. Will England. Thanks, Frank. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure for all of us to be here. And you know, I look out at, at this crowd uh, this evening and I think to myself, man, you know, the conventional wisdom is wrong. The conventional wisdom says that a market, and I use that word advisedly, that in a market like Baltimore, there's no appetite for foreign news. And I don't think that's right, do you? <laughs> well. The Sun, as Frank said, has had a long history of um, sponsoring this event. Uh, traditionally, the foreign editor of the paper um, is the MC. Uh, in recent years, it's been Robert Ruby. Before that, Jeff Price, who was my boss when I was in Moscow. Before that, it was Rich O'Mara. And if it goes back 25 years, I, before that, it would have been Leo Coughlin uh, as foreign editor. Um, the Sun, at the moment, doesn't have a foreign editor. And uh, that's why they decided they had to sort of haul me out of my comfortable little offices in the editorial department and, and come down here and sort of pinch hit. So I'll, I'll do what I can. I could talk about the uh, newspapering and foreign news today, but um, I think we've got a really good panel tonight, and there's a lot of news, so I'll, I'll save that for another time, or for later at least. Um, we want to do something a little bit different tonight than we've done in, in the years past, which is, as Frank said, talk about uh, what's going on in the world, and there seems to be an awful lot going on in the world. And because we're right heading toward um, what may be or, or most probably will be um, fairly significant midterm elections, we want to talk about how that reflects uh, back on, um, how, how foreign affairs reflect back on what's happening here domestically. Um, but I, let me just begin with a little bit of a, a kind of an overview of, what, of, of what's going on. And I'll just start with this week. In fact, I'll start with today, um, uh, bringing sit-go diplomacy to New York. Um, Hugo Chavez said he detected a sulfurous odor in the halls of the General Assembly and said that President Bush was um, the devil incarnate. Um, that's really upping the ante, I think, a little bit, isn't it? Uh, a coup in Thailand. Well, people got a little uneasy about that because it brought back memories of the Asian financial collapse of the late 90s. And, you know, there's this concern about this quite small but still rather tenacious um, Muslim insurgency that's going on in Thailand uh, at the moment. Rioting in Budapest. Uh, apparently the politicians there, the leaders, were caught out in a lie and I guess we can gather from this that the Hungarians hold their elected officials to a certain higher standard than people do in a lot of other countries. <laughs> I know that some people in the audience are saying to themselves, doesn't he know that that city is called Budapest? And I just want to say that being on the editorial board of The Sun, I've always been very conservative. I believe in the good old fashioned traditional English pronunciations of uh, cities and, and states, particularly in Europe. So I'm going to stick to Budapest. Um, Japan is picking a new prime minister, and first, one of the first things he said was that he wants Japan to take a more forward stance in the region and, and in the world, and you can imagine how thrilled the Chinese were to hear about that. Uh, Iran, of course, is on the front burner, um, and I don't think I need to talk too much about that at the moment. What it means is that um, North Korea is simply waiting its turn to move on to the front burner. Uh, Darfur. Looked like maybe it was heading toward a solution. Uh, quite clearly it's not. It's unraveling, even as we speak. Um, pretty much the same thing, although in a milder form, could be said about Afghanistan. Uh, and we have, um, f a few weeks back, Pervez Musharraf of Pakistan um, entering into a truce with the tribal leaders in the Northwest provinces, which effectively ends any hope of routing the Taliban or of catching the last remnants of al-Qaeda leadership. Now, I'll just step back from it. That's just today's news, pretty much. I'll step back for, for a moment here 
talk about some other things that are going on. Of course, I forgot one thing. Uh, the Pope has very helpfully demonstrated to us the depth of Muslim um, prickliness and, and anger toward the West. Uh, one thing we're, we're seeing is that, in fact, um, the issue of uh, the Muslim population in the European countries and their, the, the depth of their hostility is really catching, I think, a lot of people by surprise. It's a, it's a serious issue. It should make us appreciate um, our own uh, situation with immigration. Um, I think it's a uh, difficult and intractable problem and it's, it poses a threat to more than simply the European countries um, that have been affected so far. What else do we have going on? Uh, I think talking of places where we thought there was a solution and it seems like maybe there isn't a solution, uh, Kosovo probably will be um, back in the headlines, not between now and the elections, but our elections, but you know, soon enough. Uh, in Russia, we have um, interest in selling oil and in making trouble, I think pretty much in that order, but um, it's, that's something else we're going to have to be dealing with. Nobody knows what the long-term or medium-term or for that matter short-term consequences are going to be of Israel's conflict with Hezbollah in Lebanon um, this summer. Uh, it's something else we're going to have to be living with. And the Palestinians, of course, are um, getting, politically speaking, you know, close to the end of, the, of their own rope. And um, I hope that we can get Anne to talk a little bit about that later on. Um, now, speaking as a, someone whose focus has always been on what you might call um, Eurasia, um, I will say this, I think that we're going to be getting a lot of issues coming our way from the South um, now and in the, in the near future. Number one, obviously, is immigration. It's not the same problem that the Europeans face, but it's, a, it's an issue, it's complex. It, it's not something that lends itself to a simple solution, much as our politicians would um, like to pretend that it does. Um, we also have the continuation of this very strange phenomenon of these razor-thin electoral uh, races, victories. Uh, it started in Florida in 2000. We saw it in Germany last year. We saw it in Italy, and now we've seen it in Mexico. Um, I don't think the losing party in Mexico is too keen on accepting the results. And again, that's something that the U.S. may have to um, the consequences of that is something that the U.S. may have to live with. If I had to predict which might be next on that score, I would say, you know, we might be the state of Maryland come November, but we'll see. Um, also to the south, we have a potentially very large uh, oil find in the Gulf of Mexico, deep water. Um, what will that mean for us? Very hard to say. Cuba. Two issues in Cuba. At one end of the island, we've got Fidel Castro still recovering. Uh, he may not be giving up the reins tomorrow, but it, clearly it's going to happen um, some point in the very foreseeable future, and that's something that the U.S. is going to have to deal with and could have really quite a profound effect on us, among other things, on politics in the state of Florida, and I think we all have a pretty good idea of what politics in the state of Florida means for politics in the United States of America. The other end of the island, we've got Guantanamo, um, and whatever eventually happens with Guantanamo, there's no question <coughs> that it has greatly colored the uh, uh, feelings, uh, the views that people in other countries of the world have about the United States. And I believe that's something that we're going to be living with for at least the next, <coughs> at least the next generation. Um, as I said, of course, as I began this little uh, Cook's tour, uh, we have Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Um, also interested in selling oil and in making trouble, but he, his interest may be the opposite of Russia's. It may be the other way around. I'm not sure. Um, and, of course, a general uh, uh, series of victories by, you know, relatively leftist parties in South America, specifically in, in Brazil and Bolivia, um, parties that basically their attitude is globalization, you know, I don't think so. So... All of this is kind of, is kind of going around, and, and, and there's much more at f afoot as well. The one 
course, gorilla, that, or I should say the elephant, I suppose. That's the right term. The elephant in the room that I haven't mentioned is Iraq, which is the big foreign policy issue we're living with um, right now and will, of course, I think be a pretty um, major part of the election campaign. Um, we're gonna, I want to talk about the politics of Iraq, but also I want to talk about policy just a little bit. And I think I would like to uh, begin with David down here to talk about an instrument of American foreign policy and what Iraq uh, has, has uh, how Iraq has affected that instrument. David, in, in um, late August, uh, John Lehman, the Secretary of the Navy um, under the Reagan administration, wrote in another newspaper, which exists just about 35 miles down the road down here, um, the following. And I'll, I'll, forgive me while I quote here. The military occupation in Iraq is consuming practically the entire defense budget and stretching the army to its operational limits. This is understood quite clearly by both our friends and our enemies, and as a result, our ability to deter enemies around the world is disintegrating. Now, those are pretty powerful words, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the uh, ramifications of our now three and a half year involvement in Iraq. Sure, be happy to. The, the military, of course, is the instrument through which foreign policy is carried out, and so uh, it's important that, that we have a sort of a robust military. And we have bought ourselves in this country, I think the best military that's ever existed, probably on the face of the planet. As long as John Lehman is being uh, exaggerational, I guess I could be too. <clears throat> um, but if you, if you were to walk down a Baghdad street with a 35-year-old sergeant first class, as I have many times, uh, and watch this guy in action, um, he's got to be able to uh, direct his platoon in a firefight. He's got to be able to coax the uh, neighborhood elders into a committee meeting so they can decide what to do and how to govern their neighborhood. And he's got to figure out how to steal uh, a couple of thousand dollars from the United States Army so he can afford to pay the guys he's hired to haul trash out of the neighborhood. And all this on 130 degree heat and dust and, <clears throat> and it goes on for a year. And of course, the ever present uh, threat of death. Uh, these guys, and, and I know a lot of them because I do most of my reporting out in the field, uh, these men and women that we have hired to do this work are good, they love doing it, they're smart, they're gentle, they're tolerant, they're creative, and they are very, very good killers. And this is kind of a surprise for those of us who wondered, how would we do in a war like this? The answer is, they're doing really well. The Army has about 500,000 of these folks, <clears throat> and uh, the Navy about 300,000, the Air Force 275,000, and the Marines uh, almost 180,000, uh, and about 20% of these people are women, except in the Marine Corps where there's very few of them, of course. So you got a half a million people in the Army, and in order to keep that number in the Army, every year the Army has to recruit about 70,000 kids. And they have 6,000 recruiters out on the streets to do this. And this year, they are recruiting 70,000 plus another 10,000. So they're doing really well. A, a really surprising thing about this whole recruiting business is that the vast majority of American kids, about two thirds, don't qualify to get into the Army. They don't qualify because they've got a medical problem, because they haven't finished high school, because they're not smart enough to pass the test, because they have a criminal record or some, something. But two-thirds of the kids in America don't qualify, don't meet the Army's recruiting standards. So they're recruiting from a kind of a small base. <clears throat> the re-enlistment rates. In the Army, you usually enlist for four years, and so every four years you come up to a decision, do I re-enlist or not? <clears throat> and usually there's a lot of pressure on the family to say, hey, you know what, you've done your bit, you've done enough, go out and earn some money and, and do something safer. The re-enlistment rates in the Army are record high. In fact, the Army is re-enlisting 
way more people than it needs and way more people than it's planned, which is kind of a problem because there's getting to be a bulge in the army of very, very experienced people who love what they're doing and don't want to leave. So that's what's going on inside the army. <clears throat> the recruiting is good, the retention is good, everybody's happy, kids love doing this business called war and they're good at it. Here's the problem. In Iraq today, there are about 147,000 American troops. <clears throat> and in Afghanistan, there's 19,084 19, troops in Afghanistan today, because I asked the commander in Afghanistan this morning. Um, okay, so say 20,000 people in Afghanistan, 147,000 in Iraq, makes about 170,000 people on duty in Iraq and Afghanistan today. There are an equal number, 170,000 people in the military who've just come back from duty in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. And so they're getting married, going to school, taking vacations, and they're getting ready to go, go again. They'll go again in about 18 months. And there's another group of 170,000 people who are at this moment training to go in about six months. So if you add up all these people who are either there, just back, or getting ready to go, it comes up, if my calculator is correct, 510,000 people. Now remember that there are 500,000 people in the Army. Um, and so in order to scrape through, uh, military commanders are using a lot of Marines, a lot of reservists, a lot of National Guard. There's some Navy corpsmen there. And anyway, we're sort of scraping through, but you see the problem. Iraq and Afghanistan are using up almost all of our military people. And, the f and I, you know, I hear what John Lehman's saying about it's wearing the army out. In fact, it's not wearing the army out. You know, I've been out there and I've, I know the sergeants and, and I, you know, I spend a lot of time asking this very question. The army's doing quite well, thank you very much. The problem is there's not enough of them to do what this country has asked them to do. Please ask me questions about this later on, but there's, there's one thought I want to leave you with about th this, and, and that's this. If something big were to happen where we needed a lot of troops, we don't have them. Um, however, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, the military commanders are telling me that they're doing about as much as they can do. For example, uh, General James Jones, who's the NATO commander and, and is in charge of the operation in Afghanistan, told me this morning that <clears throat> Afghanistan basically is, is going to collapse because of the drug problem. Major, major problem here of uh, people growing poppies, selling the opium. That's funding the terrorism. It's getting worse and worse, and it's not controlled. The military is not allowed to take that on as a, as a mission. Um, and so, he, privately, he's not very optimistic about Afghanistan, but that's not a military problem. It's not a military problem. And the same thing is true in Iraq, where the, mili the U.S. military is doing pretty much all that a military can do. From here on out, it's not a military problem. So that I'm not sure that this shortage of military people is directly affecting what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's a bigger problem than that, and I'd be happy to talk about it in more detail. Thanks. K Karen, let's, let, let's <clears throat> turn to you. The Army is doing what it can. There, something big hasn't um, broken out elsewhere, and, and it, it may not. Um, uh, President Bush's approval ratings are inching upwards. Um, is Iraq uh, the overall picture of policy there, not the Army's performance there, is that or how much of a, of a factor are, are we going to see in these midterm elections? Uh, well, President Bush was asked at a press conference uh, last Friday that was mostly on international issues, uh, wh what about the prospect that, in fact, the election would turn on the economy instead? And he said, words the effect of, gosh, I sure hope so. Um, he said it much differently. Of course, the economy is so robust. I thought that was telling, though, because, uh, first of all, the economy 
ain't that good for an awful lot of people, middle class people who have, you know, mortgages are going up, wages are stagnant. There's something called the mortgage mom, uh, the, who is the new sought after uh, chick in the uh, chick vote in the uh, election coming up. Um, but the other part that's, that's really more revealing is that um, for most of Bush's presidency, foreign policy has been his friend. Um, I've sort of thought sometimes that if Osama bin Laden didn't exist, Bush would have had to invent him. If you remember, he came into office in a kind of really shaky way, uh, long division and that finally had to be uh, decided by the Supreme Court. And even by September 10th of 2001, his presidency was floundering. He passed his tax cuts and so forth, but the economy was starting to slide down. There was questions about the budget and Social Security and so on. And then Osama. Um, Bush, in his moment on the wreckage of the World Trade Center a few days later, his megaphone moment, brought his presidency together, and he, he established what has been the, the strength of it, really. Um, you know, he, people became patriotic and looked to him as a, as a protector and so forth, at least enough of them to make a difference. Um, it's been a comfortable place for him. It's been a place that he returns all the time when he's in trouble. Um, of course, he's just done that recently, reminding us that about the war on terror and so forth. That's how he got through the 2002 elections, the 2004 elections, and he's, and he's trying it again now. And, and frankly, when we had the problem in London, I thought, oh my God, was that Karl Rove or what? I mean, you know, the, all of a sudden the poll ratings that were starting to go up again. But of course, the, the, the uh, Downward effect, the opposite number there has been Iraq, and he might say that's connected to the war on terror, but it's been um, the, if not the undoing of his presidency, it has the potential seriously to cripple it uh, for the last two years of his term. His poll ratings, of course, have, have gone to record lows. I mean, Nixon region, um, Nixon pre-resignation re uh, region, he, um, He's not quite at the place that Lyndon Johnson was when he told us he wasn't going to run again, um, or perhaps even Jimmy Carter when, during the Iran hostage crisis. But it's, 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 uh, it's been so bad that with the midterm elections coming up, of course, his party has, you know, they don't know his name. Um, it, I mean, you have to remember about Congress, it's all about them. I mean, and in the end of the day, that's what they care about, and they have been fleeing from him um, like mad. Um, one of the most telling uh, parts of that, well, I should note, just recently in Maryland, a man came to Maryland, and there was no Republican officials present. Now, we have one or two, I think, who might have, but no, they were all busy. Um, but also a, a ramification of this is that President Bush had hoped that this little section a period of, that Congress is in session before the election, before it comes back for the lame duck session at which the real work will be done. Um, Mr. Bush had hoped that the Senate, the Congress would just rubber stamp his policies on um, uh, interrogation of terror suspects and the wire, warrantless <coughs> wiretapping of Americans. He doesn't usually say it that way. Um, but that has run into great resistance from his own party. And as you know, three senators, um, Republican senators, have, have really stood up against it. So it's beginning to look as though that may not happen before they go into the elections, which is, which is a sign that even if Bush doesn't lose his um, one house or another of Congress, um, his, his ability to, to keep his Republicans in marching in lockstep, at least at this point, has been uh, severely limited. Um, there is, however, another side to this, and it's also a kind of a foreign policy double black back flip um, feature, and it's oil prices. Oil prices are coming down. Gasoline prices are coming down, I should say. Oil prices, too. And you know, 20 to 30 cents a gallon, maybe. And it, you know, you think of that perhaps as a domestic issue, but it's really very much all you know, prices are set on the world market <clears throat> by the speculators, who, uh, among many things, look at the volatility of the world. And even though, as Will just described it, the world is pretty volatile, um, it has appeared less so uh, recently. And to the 
to the speculators. And when you combine that with a, a, lack, a, a very slow hurricane season and so forth, um, oil prices are going down, gasoline prices are going down. And, and the voter also thinks about number one. And, um, and that could really make, it, make a difference. My own sense is that um, I, I don't, well, I've always thought the Democrats were way premature in celebrating their takeover of Congress. Um, I, I'm, I don't think it's going to be the Senate, and I, well, I'm just, I'm just doubtful that it will be even the House. But because when you come right down to choosing your very own person, you tend not to think, most people don't vote strategically. Um, it, you know, they vote for their uh, person. But the question is, you know, I guess, you know, where does this go? Um, we have seen, well, I should say what's happened already. Of course, you've seen Lieberman, Joe Lieberman, lost his Democratic primary to an anti-war candidate. I mean, it's very, it is very much an issue. Um, uh, Lincoln Chafee, sort of on the opposite number, is a Republican who is anti-war, almost anti-Republican, but he was saved by the establishment of his own party um, because they really want the seat. Um, we have the uh, interesting uh, race right nearby in Virginia between um, George Allen and Jim Webb, the former Navy secretary, who is running specifically on Iraq. Um, and that race is sort of twisted off into some weird uh, weird places about ethnic slurs and so forth. So it'll be interesting to, to see how that works out. Um, and our 2008 candidates, just looking ahead, I mean, 2008 is a million years away, a lifetime in politics, as they say. But we've already seen Hillary Clinton, who was for the war, leap to the side of, of Ned Lamont, um, even though her husband campaigned for Joe Lieberman. Um, John McCain, who is the likely or the, at least the front runner in the Republican side right now is, is among the senators standing up to the president on the um, detainee interrogations. Now, I think that's just John McCain, and it certainly doesn't uh, get him very far in the Republican base, but it, um, but it helps him elsewhere. So, I, um, it, again, I, I don't know where we will go in 2008, but I think it's probably safe to say that Iraq will still be with us. Thanks, Karen. Let's, let's move to um, Maryland, uh, and Matt, I, I really actually have two questions for you. Um, for the first time in just about ever since I can remember with this open Senate seat, we've got actually two credible candidates um, running for it, and uh, with foreign policy being as big an issue as it's been in a very long time, I'm just wondering if you could <coughs> talk a little bit about um, Iraq in, in terms of the Cardin and, and steel race. And something else I'd like to think about, like you to think about or, or you know, uh, muse on just slightly is if it should happen that the Democrats take the House, um, Steny Hoyer will be in a position to take a uh, leadership position. I think it looks like there may might be a struggle over that, but I'm wondering uh, going from from his his uh, his own position on on sort of these issues, I'm wondering if that gives us any inkling of what a sort of a democratic position on Iraq might be, assuming they take power in the in in the House. I wonder if you could try to address those two yeah, things. I'm going to do the second one first. Okay. Um, what's interesting is if the Democrats win the majority in the House, John Murtha of Pennsylvania has said that he is interested in challenging Hoyer for the majority leadership. Um, which is interesting because Hoyer has been at odds with Nancy Pelosi, who would become the speaker, on uh, policy in Iraq. Uh, Pelosi favors an immediate withdrawal, and Hoyer has said uh, no immediate withdrawal. He wants to get through a series of benchmarks. He wants to talk about those benchmarks. He rejects the idea of timetables uh, for the reasons that other people do, concerns that that uh, signals what the United States is going to be doing to its enemies. Um, so uh, that's a real open question as to who would win that uh, debate or who would win that election between Mirtha and Hoyer and what that would mean for a democratic position. Presumably, if Mirtha wins, then together with Pelosi, there might be some more party unity on that. And on what has been, uh, frankly, a difficult uh, issue for the party or for really anyone who opposes the war to come to some unified, well, what do we do now uh, position. Uh, so that will be interesting to watch if the Democrats win. 
Um, what I wanted to talk about as far as how uh, the war is likely to play out in the election, I wanted to start with a couple of surveys of, of voter opinions. We did a poll at the Sun in July, uh, which is our most recent poll, on attitudes about Iraq or, or the question of what the country should do now. And 74% of Marylanders favored some form of pullout. Uh, the 59% of those wanted a gradual pullout to begin now. And 15% and said, let's get out immediately. But that 74% total is up from 69% last November. Uh, against that, there were 22% who said the United States should be uh, maintaining its presence there or, or increasing its presence. That's down from 25% last November. So you have a, a great deal of dissatisfaction with what's been going on in Iraq, uh, here in Maryland. At the same time, I spent the summer covering the, uh, the Senate Democratic primary, and at each stop that I would go to, uh, I, would, I would talk to uh, voters and ask them, what are the issues of concern uh, to you as you think about your vote this fall? And uh, the number one uh, concern was education, and the number two concern that I heard was uh, the economy and jobs, and, and those track closely with what we get from our own poll results. But what interests me most about this, because I've been following Iraq, is uh, not one person out of the dozens I spoke to even mentioned Iraq uh, among the, the, I left it open-ended, what concerns you. So uh, presumably it's going to be an issue, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction, but it's difficult to separate how much of an issue that's going to be going forward. Um, now having said that, uh, the two candidates for the Senate, there are three candidates, but the Republican and the Democrat do have some differences in their positions. Ben Cardin voted against the initial uh, authorization of military force in Iraq. Since then, uh, he's voted to support appropriations to fund the operations in Iraq, which is something that some of his uh, primary opponents hit him on during the campaign, said he wasn't a true anti-war candidate. Now, however, in the general election, he does appear to be between the two the anti-war candidate. Uh, Cardin has called on President Bush to begin bringing troops home now. He, he says that because the President isn't acting, Congress now has to. He talks about bringing home 10,000 troops a month as a, as a rough guideline, uh, starting with the National Guard and finishing before the end of 2007. He says that the United States should be drawing uh, other nations in. Uh, he proposes a peace conference to talk about brokering a ceasefire uh, in Iraq between the warring parties and uh, organizing reconstruction uh, and humanitarian aid. Um, Michael Steele has not spoken a great deal about Iraq. He has, uh, on the one hand, said that he supports the mission. On the other hand, he's also been uh, critical of the administration's conduct of the war. And, and he said uh, the administration ought to be frank with the American people about what it thought was going to happen and what actually has happened. Um, he says that that's been a missed opportunity for the administration to draw the American people along on what he says is a vitally important mission. He says that timetables, uh, as I said earlier, he is among those who, who say the timetables just play into the hands of America's enemies. He talks about getting troops home as soon as possible by working through the steps that would make the Iraqi military and the Iraqi government able to sustain themselves. Um, that's what's going on in the Senate race. There isn't a whole lot of competition in the congressional races in the, in the state. Um, there are a couple of interesting dynamics. One of them is, is the hoyer uh, mirtha matchup in a Democratic majority. The other is out in Western Maryland, which is obviously very re Republican. You have against Roscoe Bartlett, who is supporting keeping troops there until the job <coughs> is done. Uh, you have a Iraq war veteran who has a a lengthy and interesting uh, set of steps that he proposes for uh, bringing U.S. troops out. It's based on his uh, experience in the Balkans, and, and it basically lays out a, a similar program for what troops need to do in Iraq. Uh, so it's difficult to know now uh, how much of a, how important the issue is going to be for Maryland voters going in, I, the issue of Iraq. My sense is that it's, it's something that, like plenty of other issues right now, polarize people in the same sorts of directions. And so it may be one among many positions. If you are with President Bush, 
you may appreciate his message of steadfastness uh, in the same way that you appreciate his positions on other issues. And if you are against him, you, it may be another thing on which you're against him. Thank you very much. That um, brings to a close the, the sort of prepared um, presentations that we wanted to make tonight. We're going to open it up to questions, um, but I'm going to reserve for myself the right to ask the first question. And I want to ask it of Ann, um, who, and, and turn it to um, another issue besides Iraq, which is the um, uh, question of Israel and specifically the um, conflict it had with Hezbollah this summer. And, and Karen, as you both recall, when we had candidates in to the editorial board this summer, um, specifically for the Senate race and the third district congressional seat, we asked them what their position was um, on American policy toward Israel. And I, I think it's fair to say the general answer we got was, well, and it was a careful one on all, on all um, fronts. Israel, of course, has a right to defend itself, but there comes a moment when it's self-defeating to continue to pursue that kind of, a, of an action. And I would have you know, tried to make a point of that. I think that's a fair summation of what we generally were hearing. I guess my question is if you could, you could, you know, just sort of play with this a little bit, is how, how much does it actually matter the, uh, whether Israel got or uh, didn't get a green light from the Bush administration on this? How clearly they have to pay attention to American um, uh, opinion, but um, to what extent? Could you maybe just talk about that a little bit? Okay. Um, you know, I think the real issue for uh, me in the um, Israeli Hezbollah conflict was the fact that the United States just kept pushing Israel, and I think it was to no one's good end. I mean, the way that ended up uh, really hurt American foreign policy interests, I think, in the region. Um, Hezbollah staying power, all they had to do was hold on, and they did, and they did, uh, did incredibly well considering what we all thought was gonna happen in that confrontation, and it not only hurt Israel's interest, I mean, it was the best, Israel has the best equipped, the best man, um, modern army in that region, and um, the fact that they couldn't overcome or overwhelm Hezbollah has had um, domestic consequences for the Ehud Olmert administration, it's shown very significantly and graphically how tough dealing with a terrorist organization like Hezbollah is and what it, what it would take or might take to uh, uproot them from Lebanon. Uh, it was a great benefit, the fact that Hezbollah hung on and did as well at, as they did was a great benefit to Iran, which as you know, or you, you know, should know, is, um, uh, a sponsor of Hezbollah, it, it emboldened Iran, and also it, uh, the outcome of that war uh, also pointed up our really poor policy with, towards Syria. Um, you know, isolating Syria really, I don't think, has served the, the Bush administration well. Uh, when this thing took off and it looked like it was gonna go more than a week and more than 10 days, um, I think what the Bush administration should have done is at least tried to have some back-channel negotiations with Syria to get them to clamp down on the political leadership of um, Hezbollah in some fashion. And uh, I, you know, I just was, every day I was hoping to pick up the, the New York Times or the LA Times or the Washington Post for that matter to see that, you know, some respectable, um, foreign policy person within the Bush sphere was on a plane to Damascus or was in Damascus trying to have some conversations and we never saw that. And I think, um, you know, what the Hezbollah and Israel confrontation pointed up to my mind is that the U.S. in some way, in some fashion, has got to reach out to the Assad government in Syria. Uh, it doesn't serve us any, it doesn't serve us well at all to have Iran and Syria so closely aligned. To my mind, the Syrian people and even the Syrian government um, could do much better uh, having us on their side than Iran 
it would open up a lot of doors for them if, if we made the gesture towards them. And, um, but the Bush administration and the president himself, I think, are very, is very, are, they're both, uh, once they take a position, they don't, they don't back down from it, despite the fact that it isn't serving our interests well. Um, for Israel right now, um, they are trying to deal with how to move forward um, in this environment. I mean, what the month-long fight showed the Israeli people is they really, it really doesn't matter if, they, if you've pulled out of southern Lebanon and have been out for six years. If um, Hezbollah has maintains its position there and its political um, uh, uh, power in, the, in Lebanon and has got the means visa, uh, via Syria and Iran to uh, arm themselves, then they are a threat. And I don't think the Israelis uh, have figured out yet how best to um, manage that threat. Uh, the war was pretty unpopular. I mean, it, it was vocally Israelis were trying to back the government. They felt it was important to respond. I mean, Hezbollah started this. There's no question about that. Um, and But as time went on and the Katusha rockets kept hitting Haifa and moving closer into the country, I think Israelis really um, wanted the war to stop in some fashion because it was just not uh, living in shelters for, you know, 20 some days and seeing that their army really wasn't making any headway um, was uh, reinforcing the ex existential threat they've always felt. Um, so I think, you know, we haven't heard much about the agreement that was struck uh, with the UN saved everybody, uh, saved face, I think, for the Israelis. We, there were conditions put on that agreement about disarming Hezbollah. I don't think we've heard anything about that for some time now, and I don't gather that we will. Um, the only good thing I think that's come out of that um, agreement is that we do have the Lebanese army in South Lebanon now, and hopefully they are um, taking some control that is needed to be uh, there and in some way at least diminishing maybe um, Hezbollah's military edge in the south. Uh, but I think that's an area, while quiet right now, uh, it, it could flare up at any time. And uh, I don't think anyone's offered up a good solution to how to contain Hezbollah. Thanks, Anne. Now, how about some questions from, from the audience? How, how are we going to do this, Frank? Are there microphones or? No. I'll repeat the question. OK, here's one right over here. question is, if we're going to stay in Iraq until we win, well, how do we know when we've won? Um, David, maybe you could take I'd that. love to take a crack at that. Um, I, I think by winning, what we mean is we can leave without the place falling apart. And, um, you know, it gets back to the point I was making earlier. The people we have, those 140,000, 147,000 people in Iraq, are really, really good <coughs> at the military, the tactical part of it. What they can't do is all the stuff that now needs to be done. Rooting out corruption, standing up the government, giving a little spine to Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister, um, cleaning out the prisons that the Iraqis have, uh, helping them in all the little unglamorous pieces of governance that they've got to do in order to stabilize that place. Can you all hear me over there? Okay. Um, and we're not getting there. That's the point I was trying to make earlier. The military commanders are very, very frustrated um, that they're doing what they can on the security side. And, uh, you know, when American soldiers go up against the insurgents, the American soldiers win every time. That's not at issue here. What is at issue is can the, can the Iraqi central government take hold and begin to govern that place? And that's why there's so much frustration and gloom among the military commanders I talked to because that's not happening. And the reason it's not happening is that this government, our government, hasn't stepped up to the task of doing it. Okay, here's one right here. I want to pick up on the Middle East where the last speaker. I may be the only one here that thinks that Israel won the war because if 
I'll, I'll just repeat that for everybody. The, the, the central question is, it, it seems to the questioner that Israel, in fact, won the war. Um, uh, things didn't turn out that badly for it. Um, he, uh, an elaboration of the question got to the point that um, Israel can only have politicians as good as the, the people, and that we're, as with any democracy, I think. And um, there's a generational change going on right now. And isn't Israel actually in pretty good shape? Anne? Ah, uh, um, no, it, you obviously know your, your stuff. Um, I, I still don't think that Israel won the war. I think, they, I think they did damage to Hezbollah, but I think if you asked most Israelis, I don't think they would say they won the war because when, when this whole thing started, the idea here was to wipe out Hezbollah. And there's been a lot of, well, how? I, 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 don't know, I don't know myself how. I don't know how they thought they were going to, but I think the debate in Israel has, uh, what's been generated from the war was a whole um, discussion over whether uh, the generals were doing what they should have done. Should they have sent troops in earlier? Should they have sent troops in from the get-go? They relied on, a, on a, um, an air war that in the end did not cause a great deal of damage to Lebanon and a great deal of damage uh, as a result to, I think, Israel's um, uh, profile in the world because of the civilian casualties that you saw, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Here's a question right over here. Yeah, yes. It's, it's me. I happen to be an American citizen and, you know, fine with Israel, fine with all stuff. And I was really concerned about what's happening in my country Okay, I think I'll take that one on. Um, <laughs> the question is, uh, uh, when are we going to wake up to the problems of illegal immigration and, and what are we going to do about it? And um, the second part of that question is, is a lot tougher to answer than the first part of the question. Um, are we being invaded? Um, you know, the issue of illegal <laughs> immigration is that uh, an awful lot of people um, don't like undocumented aliens, foreigners, um, <laughs> coming here and taking jobs. And on, on one score, that, that helps to uh, depress wages uh, for ordinary Americans. And I, th I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, illegal Im immigrants tend to be terribly exploited by employers uh, because they don't have very much of a recourse. And that also tends to worsen conditions for generally uh, in workplaces around the country. Um, at the same time, there's a very, very powerful lobby in favor of immigrants, and that is a lobby um, of conservative, politically conservative um, businessmen, the business women, um, because immigrants do a, a lot of the work and they do it cheaply and they can be exploited by the unscrupulous ones. But um, a lot of the work being done by immigrants is work that typically you would find it difficult to f find Americans who who could do that sort of thing. Um, it's a, 
it's a, a very thorny problem. We can't simply uh, build a wall the way the Israelis are building a wall across the desert from Brownsville to San Diego. Um, why not? It's, it's, a, it's a long, long, long way. Now, I suppose, yes, physically, I mean, theoretically, yes, it would be um, conceivable that that could be done. Essentially, the American economy is now built in a way that it, it, not, it relies on two things, and one of them is this weird unhealthy embrace with China, but the other is having a flow of, of young workers coming in. Um, one thing I would point out is that uh, without immigrants, um, in a little while there wouldn't be people um, on payrolls paying taxes because a lot of, a lot of illegal immigrants are paying or their employers are paying payroll taxes that help support the Social Security system. Um, I think it's an open question. Certainly they are a drain on local resources. I think it's an open question as to whether they're actually, uh, physically speaking, a drain on the, on the um, government. So I've given you a real sort of namby-pamby, middle-of-the-road answer. But as I said right in the beginning, I don't think there's a simple, easy solution to um, the issue of illegal immigrants here. <coughs> Obviously, some people do. Um, the Bush administration wants to have a, an orderly program for allowing immigrants in to work, undocumented immigrants, uh, on a temporary basis. I think that's a good idea. Um, what we have said at, at The Sun is that's a good idea, but there has to be another side to that coin, which is um, enforcement of uh, existing labor regulations um, to prevent the exploitation um, of these immigrants. Now, there's a question way, way over there. Okay, let me, let me try to re uh, re repeat the question quickly. With turnover in the Army, it, it sounded to the questioner like it was about 14%. With the lowering of standards uh, for uh, enlistees, um, what is that going to do to the Army in the medium long term? Um, it's a very complicated question. The whole, the issue of uh, what scores do potential recruits make when they take the Armed Forces entrance uh, exams uh, the, the lowest category the Army is taking is those who score 25 in the 25th percentile of which is normed to every 17 to 24 year old. Um, and so I've taken this test. You know, it's full of stuff like, you know, if Joe bought six paintings at $125 each and sold them later for $148 each, what percent was his profit? And you have about six seconds to answer that because there are hundreds of questions like that. Um, so when you're talking about, you know, the, the smartness of people coming into the military, I don't think there's a whole lot to worry about. Um, the Army is dipping into those people who make at, uh, who, who score down to the 25th percentile. And I'll leave it to somebody smarter to me to explain where that puts them in the education uh, spectrum across of kids across the country. But the fact is they have to be high school graduates and have a pretty clean record. And, um, you know, the, 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 uh, from everything I've seen of kids in basic training, and I spent a lot of time out in the rain and mud with these kids as they go through their basic training. Um, they're pretty good kids, and they seem to be doing okay. Do you have any questions over here? Uh, yes, right in the front row. Uh, you know, you were mentioning that these are uh, the responsibilities of the new immigration was different. These are easier times for not to kill civilians and children. And uh, Hezbollah was hiding among hospitals and nursing homes and civilian areas. Therefore, the Israelis were trying to stay by, whereas the other guys were hiding to kill their own people. Okay, here's another question for Anne. The question is a uh, completely, I think, indisputable point that there were different rules of engagement when Israel was fighting against Hezbollah. Israel was endeavoring to avoid 
uh, civilian casualties to the extent it could. Hezbollah was hiding among uh, nurseries and schools and apartment houses and hospitals. Um, Anne, could you address that? No, I think you're absolutely right, and I and I I think that um, that certainly played a part in uh, the outcome of the war. But um, I think again, what it pointed up is how intractable a foe it uh, Hezbollah is, and I don't know that anyone has come up with a military way to um, remove it. David, let me let me ask you a, f a follow up question. Any lessons for the U.S. military in from Lebanon? Yeah, uh, huge ones. Uh, you know, you're watching the Israeli bombing campaign, trying to trying to root out Hezbollah from uh, from where they're hiding uh, with air power, and I tell you what, the Air Force guys in the Pentagon were horrified um, because that's you know the enemy has finally learned you can hide really effectively among the civilian population, and it's brutal and horrible, but you win that way. Uh, so where does that leave us? We spent billions and billions and billions of dollars a year on a great air force. That's the future, folks. It's, it's a scary thing. Here's a question here. Uh, were they actually hiding among civilians or were they hiding among Hezbollah supporters? Uh, were they hiding among civilians or amongst uh, Hezbollah supporters? Um, uh, does anybody here have an answer to that? I think the answer to that is both. Way in the back here. Okay. Question is, um, well, we sort of have an idea of what a win might be in Iraq. What's the worst case scenario if we pull out immediately? Um, David. I, I think what would happen, and maybe it wouldn't, but I think what would happen is the place would collapse into anarchy and uh, Al-Qaeda would establish a, uh, you know, I hate to say a base there, but a, a, a safe haven for operations there, and it would be much harder to get at them. I, I would like to just maybe uh, elaborate on that slightly. I think what you would find is the um, Iranians, of course, in the event of a collapse, taking a very strong interest, shall we say, in what happens in the Shiite areas, the Turks, could be counted on probably to uh, try to inflict damage upon an independent Kurdistan that would emerge. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine that the Saudis would kind of stand by and watch all this happening. Um, I think, could a conflagration be kept within uh, the boundaries of Iraq? I think that that's a very iffy question. Now, speaking as an editorial writer, I think I would say that I'm not sure that uh, hanging on there for another year or two or three or four or five is going to make much difference. And eventually, we're going to have to be leaving the place. Here's a question in the back. Yes. Uh, one of your colleagues, Mark, former colleagues, Mark Matthews, appeared on the panel many times uh, around the time of the Iraq War. And he said that uh, the Iraqi government was trying to do everything they could to keep Iraq from Did, did everybody hear that question? No. Oh, no, okay. Um, quoting a, a former um, Sun Jerusalem correspondent and State House reporter, Mark Matthews, in an op-ed in, in the, our paper this summer, suggesting that the U.S. had to try to work its way back toward being um, an honest broker between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and uh, a, a question would be, you know, can the Palestinian Authority, can, can we move toward their, the establishment of a Palestinian state? Does that, that, does that kind of sum up what you're getting at? Um, let me just begin on the, on the sort of the politics of that a little bit, if, if I could. Uh, Karen, could you? 
Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the hard one. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether it's too late for them to be an honest broker. I mean, uh, one of the problems that you know we saw in the, the last, well, the conflict with Lebanon was that they, um, you know, the Israeli, there, there was a, I guess the Seymour Hirsch piece, was it, that said that this whole thing was just sort of a, a dry run for for the an attack on Iran. I mean, it it seemed that the uh, the um, U.S. administration was was too closely tied to letting the Israelis, you know, do what it could to wipe out Hezbollah, and and as Anne suggested, um, does not seem to have been involved in any sort of back channel negotiations with with Syria and others. We've we've seen that in a number of situations. I mean, I. I'm not sure whether the Bush administration, it, 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 both the Bush administration and to some degree Israel lost a lot of credibility in that conflict and I don't know whether it's rescuable at this point. And, and to do, uh, yes, I'll let Anne get to that in a second, but do, I guess, do our own domestic politics uh, within, you know, uh, in the context of the Bush administration allow movement in that direction in the next two years or, or are they just so fully embedded in, in their current? Role. Well, they don't seem to be too pro-Arab. Um, <laughs> they, they don't. They're that. That's not their, their whole mo. Is this is this other direction? I mean, it, it, the president, of course, keeps giving lip service to to Islam and how important it is and so forth. But every everything we've done seems to be inflaming the Arab streets and the Arab world. I'm not sure that. Uh, um, that uh, it, that's a policy can pursue at this point. You know, I think that um, the president pretty much laid out where he stood in his in the speech of the United Nations, and he's not going to he's not going to budge on the um, on the financial um, blockade of the Palestinian Authority. And until that collapses, I don't think you'll see any movement there. But quite honestly, I don't think we're going to see a new direction in the Middle East in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict until. There's a new administration in the White House, and then it'll depend on who's there. Here's one right here. First of all, I would like to say that the Middle East is made up of many nations, and the Arabs are the holdout Arabs. The Iraqi, the Iranian, um, Syria, the Lebanese, they, they're not Arabs. They're Muslims. They're made Muslims, so they have a special place. Then number two, I would like to say, when people think about aliens, they always Oh. Can, oh. can I just okay. talk about the immigration? Let, let, me, let, me, let me just uh, repeat the question, okay? There were, there were sort of two parts <laughs> to it. One is, the, is what, you know, the definition um, of an Arab, and the, I think the questioner um, sees that word perhaps a little differently than I do at least, suggesting that simply people in Saudi Arabia should be called Arabs. And the second part of the question is illegal immigration. What about illegal immigration from Canada? Um, well, first of all, if I said something to offend you, I misspoke. Um, but on the immigration issue, we, we talked. There was some comment about this earlier. You know what's going on domestically. That's another sort of theoretically foreign policy issue. But as you know, the House has passed now twice a bill that would build a you know a 700 mile fence along the southern border. I think, and and their plan is to have the rest of it be electronically or or, or um, a virtual fence, right? Um, that to me, I mean, is is sort of a false sense of security. But the bill that the immigration bill that the House passed, and this is now. They're sort of trying to conference with the Senate, but they won't do it till after the election. Also suggests at least a study of building a wall on the Canadian uh, border. And apparently, I mean, in support of that, which I am not, it appears that any uh, uh, crossing, I illegal crossing of our border landwise by people with uh, alleged terrorist links have all come from the north, not from the south. Um, I personally think this is a horrible idea, um, either, frankly, both ways. But at the Canadian-U.S. border has been, you know, it's the longest piece. I mean, it's just a, it's it's offensive all around to even think about doing that. But it's a, it's it's a serious um, proposal in the Congress, 
And this election, I think, will have, that, is, that issue is perhaps more important, certainly in many districts, than, than Iraq. Because people, as, as the lady earlier suggested, people care very, very much about the effect of an immigration period, whether it's illegal or not. And a lot of districts are voting on that. And uh, whether our, our policy is going to be more uh, sort of fortress-like or more, I would say, practical, it will really be affected by this election. So I think there's a lot at stake there. I should just point out in the interest of full disclosure that Karen grew up in Niagara Falls. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Here's the question. I, on the American side. <laughs> Okay, there's a good question. If the government of Iraq uh, should, for whatever reason, ask the United States politely to leave, would the United States, as the questioner said, meekly go along, or would it um, not? Um, I, I, again, speaking as an editorial writer, I would be bet my bottom dollar that the United States would not, but I wonder if our Pentagon correspondent has a different view of that. <laughs> Boy, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. That is a great question. I, I think that we would finesse it by having them not ask us, but that, that's sort of a weasel. You know, I mean, the, the scenario you're painting is the Maliki government falls. It's replaced by a more radical group of people who seize power, um, maybe Mukhtar al Sadr, um, and they kick us out. Then what? Uh, we'd have to go. Great question. I don't know the answer. Right. Here's, here's a question right down here. How much importance do the members of the panel attach, if any, to the recent comments by Colin Powell with regard to our credibility abroad? Uh, the question is, how much importance do the members of the panel attach to the recent comments by Colin Powell um, regarding our credibility, in fact, regarding our moral standing um, in the war on terror? I think that was his exact phrase. Um, Karen. <laughs> um, I, I think he, he, he provides great cover to, to other Republican senators to join the, uh, the three that are resisting. That's, of course, Senator McCain, uh, Lindsey Graham from uh, South Carolina, and John Warner from Virginia, who's, uh, I was reminded earlier, is particularly special because he's a longtime member, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and, and a real sort of old bull of the Senate, loyal guy, and for him to stand up, it's been important. Um, those three guys have a military background, obviously, as Colin Powell does, but Colin Powell um, carries with him still enormous respect, and for him to make the point, it w not Democrats saying this, not wild-eyed liberals, not Dennis Kucinich, but someone of his stature who had served in that, in that position as Secretary of State and, and uh, uh, J Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I, I, th I think it had an enormous significance. And, and again, it's political cover. And, and they say that the ranks of the resistors are growing in the Senate. Um, you know, there, there are two issues. One is the interrogation techniques, and the other is the uh, warrantless wiretaps. That had looked like it was sort of together, but I think that's starting to unravel too, which I think is, is also a very important issue. So. It was critical of Powell, and it's sort of wonderful to watch him um, do that, isn't it? And, and Matt, isn't it also true that um, since his statement became public that somewhat surprisingly there's starting to be some second thoughts among Republicans even in the House on the president's bills? Yeah, I, I think Karen put it well when she talked about the political cover that it provided. So, yeah, I think you are seeing some of that movement. It makes it possible for people to express that statement. I think there's an additional power for Powell to say this, not only did he was he a member of the administration, but I'm unaware that he has plans to run for anything else. So while you could look at John McCain, and McCain may just, being, may just be being McCain, um, you could also say, well, he's also looking at 2008 and, and maybe, maybe looking to not run through the Republican Party, but as some sort of a centrist. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's added power to, to Powell saying it 
someone who doesn't necessarily have an obvious political interest in doing so. Okay, we have a gentleman in a dark suit who's sitting over there. Yeah. Oh, okay. My question is for David. Earlier you said that the situation in Afghanistan and in Iraq was not a military problem. It could have been more so a uh, civil administration and law enforcement that had to stop. I was just wondering, can the U.S. military and we protected by the Star Wars and Morgan be carried out those kinds of functions in addition to You know, you know, they try, and their heart's in the right place. Oh, I'm sorry. Question is, um, uh, referring to my comment that, uh, that what needs to be done in Iraq and Afghanistan involves more non-military, what the, what the military calls non-kinetic or non-killing kinds of things, such as building the capacity of the local governments. Um, I'll tell you a story that happened in Afghanistan that will illustrate my belief that the military tries to do the right thing, but they're not really all that good at this. There was a huge military operation, a huge offensive operation, <clears throat> where uh, a lot of soldiers went up into the mountains hunting down al-Qaeda, and, 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 and it was a, a, just a classic military operation. It worked really well. The idea was right at the tail end, of the army sweeping through these villages and probably destroying a lot of houses was that they were going to airdrop these really cool um, crates of stuff that people could use to rebuild their houses. And these, these are, the army invented these things. They're really neat. It's a big box, and inside the box is lumber, saws, hammers, nails, little aprons that you hold nails in, nails brooms to sweep up the sawdust, everything you need, very, very cool. And they had hundreds of these things stacked up beside the runway ready to go. Well, what happened was that uh, you know, the operation got bogged down a little bit and the aircraft that were supposed to take this relief supplies in got used to take troops and ammunition and water and MREs and all that kind of stuff. And it never got done. So the military is going, we got to do something because we promised these people aid is going to come after our military operation. What finally happened was, and, and they went through a lot of gyrations to make even this happen, they loaded a C-130 in Germany with a bunch of sacks of flour and blankets. And the idea was they were going to drop them on the uh, runway at Kandahar, which is a big city in Afghanistan. <clears throat> there was a thunderstorm. The airplane got lost. Um, somebody made a mistake and, and didn't, these are big heavy pallets of stuff, and they didn't, they put small parachutes on the boxes. So the air, aircraft finally lumbers over Kandahar, they push the stuff out the back, all these pa crates come whistling down and burst open in the rain, making a gigantic puddle of pancake mix <laughs> and sodden blankets there was one sack of flour that survived, and the guy who came to clean it up got the sack of flour. So the whole thing was a disaster. You know, it, the problem is that we need the State Department, the Agriculture Department, USAID, Commerce Department, Justice, the FBI, all these people who know how to do stuff. We need them to have deployable brigades and divisions like the Army does, but they don't. And so that's why we're not doing that stuff. Here's a question right over here. After six months in Saudi Arabia, two years ago, I came home and Saudi oil tanks. Okay, the questioner was in Saudi Arabia in, um, what, 10 years ago? Uh, and points out that the United States really doesn't use that much oil from uh, the Middle East. Most of it goes to Europe and to Asia. And uh, wouldn't it make sense to, uh, as our chief Middle East policy, to find ways to basically end our dependence on Middle East oil altogether? And I'll, I'll begin with that, but anybody else can, can weigh in. Um, I, 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 I agree, but with a sort of a caveat in a, in a way. One thing to remember is that um, oil is like water or like money. Um, it's, you know, there's a single market for it. And uh, we import 
uh, most of our oil from Canada and from Venezuela, of all places, um, and produce a fair amount of it ourselves still. But it sort of doesn't matter if the Middle East uh, blew up and, and we had not been burning any Middle Eastern oil, uh, it would send the price of, it would be a crisis anyway. It would send the price of oil sky high. There would be these huge shortages. Um, it, it would flow to the, to the people who are willing to pay for it. So in a sense, you can't have geographic independence if you still burn oil. But a better question, uh, which you raise, is wouldn't it be better to find alternatives um, to oil so we wouldn't, just have to, we wouldn't have to worry about this stuff at all, and we wouldn't have to worry about uh, the Middle East? And I think I can say I think that would be a really a, a very fine idea. Um, I don't think that ethanol is the answer because uh, growing that much corn does tremendous damage to the um, soil of this country, although ethanol from soybeans, as Karen has pointed out to me, really is, is a better process. I don't see it replacing oil, but we can look at hydrogen, you can look at um, trying to make nuclear safer. Um, surely there are a lot of things that could be worked on. I don't see that coming in the next, you know, before the next presidential election. Um, <laughs> but go ahead, yeah. Add my two cents to that. There, there is a growing um, group faction in Congress, and, and ask, actually Roscoe Bartlett of Western Maryland amazingly turns out to be green, and he's among them, um, who talk about peak oil. And, and the, the question is, w regardless of where it comes from, you know, there's only so much. It's a finite uh, uh, quality that we have, quantity that we have in the, in the earth, and, it, you know, if we haven't hit it yet, it won't be long before we hit it, and it's you know, kind of come down. And this is a time when, of course, demand in China and India is growing and growing. So there are a number of people like um, Congressman Bartlett who are saying what we ought to do, because as Will says, none of the alternatives that we know about right now seem to be anywhere close to being able to be a, a, a real substitute. We ought to do a sort of uh, invest in and put a, as a high priority, have a kind of a you know, man to the moon or Manhattan style project. And it, it could take 30 years, who knows how long, to, to really put a huge investment of best brains and so forth into the technology it would take to come up with another energy source because we're going to have to do it. Um, the other side of that, of course, is we're not doing enough in conservation. That we won't even, you know, we're still driving these stupid trucks that, you know, I have one actually because <laughs> I have to pull a horse with something um, that gets 10 miles to the gallon. I mean, what is up with that? Um, you know, so we, we, we're not doing any, what we need to do for conservation. Um, and um, so, but it's going to take, the American people really have to sort of stand up and say, you know, we want this, and, and to give the politicians the political will. And I'm sort of, the bad news about gasoline prices going down is that people become complacent and they don't care anymore. And that's, I, I tried to get the sun to argue higher gasoline taxes, but no, they wouldn't do that. Anyway, that that's my else? two cents. Want to add something to that? I, I will just also quickly point out that, of course, the extraction and use of coal uh, at, at, under current techniques uh, causes a tremendous amount of environmental damage, but we have an awful lot of coal in this country. More, more BTUs worth are in American coal, I think, than in all the known oil reserves. I, I, may, I may be wrong about that, but it's something. 400 years, 200, years, 200 it's a lot, it's a whole lot. Back here. Okay, the, the question, question
questioner believes that we're saying we ought to just make nice with everybody, although I'm not sure we've actually said that. Maybe we have. Um, and how, what's the point of doing that with people whose primary interest is in either killing us or evicting us or generally um, <coughs> taking, taking what's ours for themselves, uh, specifically talking about the, the Iranians and the terrible problems we've had dealing with the uh, North Koreans who prevaricate at, um, at the drop of a hat. Um, and I'm trying to think who's sitting here would be the would be the best and and, and well okay i mean that's a very good question and i don't think any one of us really is going to be able to put our thinking hat on and and and, and answer it to your satisfaction but i do think that um, what the discussions uh, underway with the iranians now um, i i thought it was great that the that the bush administration joined europe and and agreed to come to the table if the iranians would do what they what they wanted them to do. But the problem with talking, if you don't have everybody on board willing to take the next step, if the guy you're talking to isn't playing by the rules, then talking doesn't do anything. And as you can see, you know, even now with the discussions going on with Iran or trying to get underway with Iran, and despite uh, everyone's concern about what they're after, uh, the way they've been emboldened, I mean, France still doesn't want to uh, take a hard line against them and say the S word, sanctions. You know, I don't know that sanctions is the right way to do it, but there has to be consequences. And to my mind, if, uh, you know, the U.S. and its allies, if they really want to have a, um, a diplomatic course uh, that involves dialogue, hand-in-hand uh, -hand has to be the um, uh, decision to really take the next step if, if it doesn't work in some fashion. That's my view. I'm just checking the far corners to make sure I'm not, I haven't been missing anybody. Uh, there's, okay, you're next, but we'll get. Okay, the question is a very good one about Afghanistan. We've been there five years now, and what are we seeing but uh, opium production going up, uh, resurgence of the Taliban. I wonder if, the questioner wonders, are we um, repeating the experience of the uh, Soviets when they were there in the 1980s? One thing I would say is that no one is giving stingers to the Taliban to shoot down our helicopters. But um, David, why don't okay. you? Okay, yeah, I'll take the crack at it. Um, um, I, I'm in a good position here because I just spent an hour this morning talking to the U.S. commander in Afghanistan, so I'll relay pretty much what he said, uh, which was the following. Um, the Taliban are not a threat to the Karzai government. They're not big enough. They're not spread out enough around the country. Um, tactically and militarily, the situation seems to be relatively stable, although there's been an uptick in suicide bombers, as you know, and that's probably inevitable in that part of the world. <clears throat> um, the, there are two huge underlying problems. One is that, that, that the Afghan security forces, the police and the army, are nowhere near in a position to start operating by themselves and take over security and 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 that's and, and their proficiency is not proceeding at a very fast rate. Now the second problem of course is the one you alluded to which is a drug problem which is fueling a very very well financed bunch of terrorists, thugs, criminals, smugglers and they are a huge and growing problem that is not under any kind of control and nobody has a plan to control it. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed bag in that sense. Does that answer your question? Downhill, I would say. Oh. Uh, there was a question over here I said was going to be next. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, question is, uh, don't we see a, a, an upsurge in um, religious tension worldwide with uh, the president of Iran calling for Israel to be wiped off the map with his reaction to the, uh, the Pope's comments? And, and what can be done to um, you know, promote a sort of an ecumenical um, dialogue that might, that might tamp these down a little bit? Um, I would just say one thing quickly, and then I'm going to uh, ask Ann to um, talk about a little bit, because Anne, Anne writes about religion for us. Uh, it's in, been interesting to me that two of the biggest sort of outbreaks throughout the Muslim world of anger and of tension have had to do with Europe, um, the Danish cartoons and, and now this, the German Pope's uh, comments. And it, it, talk, it shows us a little bit about um, that we can't ignore the uh, problems, the issues. Um, going on in Western European society today, uh, and because they're, they're likely to, uh, we're likely to suffer some of the consequences. But, and ecumenicism, is there any way to do it? Well, I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, part of the problem involving um, uh, religious fundamentalism uh, is, it's a domestic problem. I mean, in there, in, in, in the countries in which this is going on, and you know, part of it is is uh, it, it's demonstrated through religion. But I think a lot of it is anti-Western sentiment, and and you know, there's been a lot of discussion about reaching out to um, uh, America, taking uh, you know a different tact with. Um, um, folks in the Arab world in terms of opening up more, bringing more people here on cultural exchanges and things like that.